Okay, so today what we are going to uh, discuss is a little bit more in depth on some of the configurations that we uh, commonly find in a lot of your residential, uh, like commercial type applications. Uh, we are going to be going over a couple more components, a little bit more in depth, is basically what we like to call the hydronic subsystems. Uh, so let's get right into it. So basically in a hydronic system, we know that we got to have a boiler. We got to have something there that's going to generate heat. So that's going to be our heat source. We know that the boiler has to be piped. We got to have some sort of distribution piping that's going to send that hot water that's being generated into the boiler through our heat emitters and our baseboard, all right, so that it can actually be released and heated up a home or a business. We know that we got to have control devices on a boiler. We got to have an aquastat. We got to have thermostats. And in many cases, we got to have a zone panel so that we can control the temperature of the rooms throughout a home in, in many ways. Okay, we have to be able to control the the rate of delivery of that heat to a space because what makes a building get cold? You know, it's the infiltration of cold air from outside. So in order for us to keep a, a building or a space comfortable, we got to have a boiler that's sized correctly to replenish the amount of heat that's being lost through, you know, windows and, and doors and, and, and walls and through ceilings. So when we look at a, a a boiler and we're doing a maintenance or we're doing a service call or what have you, even if we're installing it. You got to kind of have a broad spectrum and an idea of what's going on with this piece of equipment. So hydronic systems are basically contained into four separate categories or four subsystems as we call it. You got to have your heat source. Okay, that heat source can be an oil fired boiler. It could be a gas fired, natural gas fired boiler. It could be a boiler that's fired off of propane. You can have heat pumps. You can have all sorts of types of heat sources to heat that water. You got to have distribution piping. Distribution piping is going to be cast iron, it could be copper. Okay? You can have PEX tubing. Okay? So there's a bunch of different types of distribution systems that we are going to see. We got to have our heat emitters. Okay, our heat emitters can be our, our standard baseboard. We can have steam radiators if we're dealing with a steam boiler. We can have fan coil units, toe kick heaters, all sorts of stuff. Okay, and our control system is obviously going to be our aquastats, our limits, our primary controls, if it's an oil-fired furnace, it's going to be a zone panel. It's going to be zone valves. Those are our control systems. So as a mechanic, we have to look at all four of these categories to make sure that that system is running correctly. So basic loops, the simplest hydronic system can be best described as a loop or a piping circuit. Now, I use this a lot 
even when it comes to just talking about basic electricity, you can use the same analogy on either one. It's nothing more. Electrical circuits is nothing more than a gigantic loop. From a, has a beginning point and an ending point, and it just it just it just continues to circle and, and and continue and continue until it stops. That's what a hydronic system is. A hydronic system is nothing more than a gigantic loop. We have a boiler. That's our heat source. That's where it starts. I got to heat the water. Now, in terms of electrical, our source is going to be the power that's coming in to something. Our distribution piping, that's going to be carrying our water to our, our heat emitters. And now, when we talk about that into an electrical term, that's our wires. Our wires are carrying the electricity to where we want that electricity to go. Our heat emitters, our baseboard, is nothing more than our loads. We're using the water that's going through our distribution system to heat up a space through our heat emitters. Our steam coils, our baseboard, tow kick heaters, whatever it's going to be. Now, if we use that in terms of an electrical circuit, that's our motors, it's our valves, solenoids, something that's in the circuit that we're using the electricity to do something. And our control circuit is our switches. Something that's going to be able to turn on and off to stop the flow of the water or stop the flow of the electricity. So when you're doing a lot of troubleshooting, think about it as a water circuit. Think about it in simple terms. If you do that, it makes your life so much easier. to figure out what's going on. Okay? So if a circuit is sealed off from the atmosphere at all locations, we consider that hydronic system as what we call a closed loop system. A closed loop system is nothing more than a boiler that's being used to simply just heat a building or a house. Now, if we add domestic hot water to that circuit, where we're using the boiler to also heat up a hot water heater, that is now considered an open loop system because the system is not 100% sealed. We're using the hot water from the boiler to heat up the, water, the, the hot water heater so that we can deliver hot water to our faucets and our showers. Here is an example of a basic closed loop system. Okay, we got our heat source again. Okay, we got our our energy input. Again, this could be either gas, this could be oil, propane. Hey, this could even be electrical. This could be an electric heat element down here. It's a heat source. Something that's going to heat up the water. Our boiler is going to be filled with water. Here's our distribution piping. Water comes out of the top through our circulator, which helps flow the water through our circuit, through our heat emitters, and then it just makes its way right back to the boiler where that circle just continues until the thermostat tells the boiler and everything else to shut off. In terms of temperature controls, a basic loop system requires two 
simple control devices. Those two devices is nothing more than your room thermostat and a temperature limiting device, your Aquastat. Those are your two big components in a hydronic system that's going to control the entire thing. Now let's break that down a little bit. The thermostat. The thermostat is going to be in the space that we are heating. It's going to be sensing the room temperature. Once the room temperature falls, the thermostat is going to close. When it closes, it's going to send that signal down to the aquastat. The aquastat is going to sense the water temperature of the boiler. The aquastat is also going to be sending the signal to your circulators. It's going to be sending the signal to your burner to tell the burner to come on based off of the water temperature in a boiler. It's also going to tell the burner to shut off when the boiler water reaches a set temperature, say 150, 160 degrees. Without those two, you're going to have a boiler that's going to run rampant. And it's never going to shut off. It's never going to control anything. So the room thermostat, again, all it does, guys, is determines when the building requires heating based off of the set point temperature on that thermostat. We'll say 72 degrees. Thermostat set for 72 degrees. When that room drops below 72 degrees, we'll say 70 degrees, that thermostat's going to close. It's now going to send that signal down to the aquastat, which ensures that the water temperature within the heat source remains within a predetermined range while the demand for heat is present. Those two components work together so that we can deliver heat to our space in an efficient manner. As the water is heated, it expands. So we got to have an expansion tank. Okay, this increases in volume. Okay, and when it increases in volume, it's an extremely powerful but predictable characteristic of water that must be accommodated in any type of closed loop system. We got to have an expansion tank. As water heats up, it's going to expand. If I don't have some room for expansion in my piping circuit, I'm going to rupture pipes. I'm going to damage heat emitters. I can damage the boiler. I can crack it if I don't have room for expansion. So the expansion tank is another critical part of the piping and distribution of our water. Most modern hydronic systems use what we call the diaphragm type expansion tank, which will look as you see here. This is usually how it's going to be piped. Usually our boiler is going to be over in will be over here, we'll say. Our supply piping will get piped out of the boiler and directly into our air scoop. Our air scoop is right here. And that is doing exactly what the name states. It's scooping any air that is in that water, and it's going to shoot it out of our high vent. When you have air in, a, in your water system, you will hear a little hissing sound come out of this little high vent there. That is perfectly normal. If you start seeing water 
kind of trickle out of these things, that high vent is no good. It has failed. All you have to do is replace it. Now, if the person that installed the piping circuit and the boiler correctly and put a little thought into it, he would have installed two ball valves on either side of this air scoop so that you can just close off your water circuit so that you don't have to lose as much water and all you would have to do is unscrew this high vent and put a new one on and then open the valves and you're back in business. But let's talk about the expansion tank here. As that water is flowing through our supply pipe, some of that water, as it expands, is going to have to come down into the upper half of the expansion tank. Right where the weld is, right in the dead center of an expansion tank, that's going to be usually where that internal rubber diaphragm is actually installed. Okay, it's obviously done in, a, in the factory. We do not necessarily see it. But as that water expands, that expanded water is going to dump into this upper area of the expansion tank. The bottom half of the expansion tank is full of air. It acts like an air cushion. So as that water comes into here, it's going to press down on that diaphragm. It's going to push it down. So the air kind of acts like an air cushion. Okay, because remember, water has weight. So it's going to be a little bit heavier here. So that diaphragm is going to kind of sag down in here. And what this have, what this does is, again, it prevents your piping from getting destroyed, rupturing, breaking a boiler, so on and so forth. But once the boiler shuts off and our calls for heat, you know, satisfy, the water in that boiler is going to cool off a little bit, right? So when the water cools off, it no longer expands. It now begins to contract. So as that happens, it starts to lose its density. And what will happen is, is the pressure that is down here from our air cushion will now begin to push that diaphragm back up and will push the water back into your water circuit just through natural thermal dynamics of the density of the water. Now, your expansion tank again has that diaphragm. The bottom half has air. That air cushion has a set PSI to it. As a mechanic, it is good practice to check that PSI. See how much air pressure you actually have down here. Because what can happen is if you do not have any air pressure down there, water will eventually expand keep dumping into here and expand and expand and expand and eventually that little rubber diaphragm in there is going to rupture. It's going to break. And when that happens, your expansion tank is going to be filled with water. And what's going to happen if I have no room for expansion? My relief valve on my boiler is going to open. It's going to dump all that excess pressure onto that person's floor, basement, whatever it's going to be, wherever that boiler is going to be located. It's going to make for a bad day. So to check it, usually there's a little air discharge valve right here. It almost kind of looks like a 
a, um, a tire gauge. What you have to do is just simply take a tire pressure gauge and just put it on there. Measure the air pressure. If it's low, believe it or not, all you can do, you can take a bicycle pump. Bicycle tire pressure. Uh, a, yeah, a tire pump. Put a couple pumps of air into it and you will raise that PSI. Under here is nothing more than a Schrader valve. Small little valve. Those valves leak. They can. But if you take a pressure reading and you get water coming out of here, this expansion tank has failed. This expansion tank needs to be replaced. And again, to do that, if they piped it properly and they put a little thought into it, they would put, again, ball valves on either side of this air scoop where all you would have to do is just close them and you would be able to unscrew this expansion tank right off of the air scoop put a brand new one on, open the valves, and you're back in business. But I hate to say it, a lot of times that does not happen. So you have to look at your piping to see what you're dealing with. <coughs> so as heat is expanded, it pushes into the tank and slightly compresses that captive air volume like I just said. And as that water cools, that volume is going to decrease. It's going to condense. And this process repeats itself each time the system operates. Every time that water is heated, it's going to expand. It's going to push down on that diaphragm. As it's cooled off, it's going to compress and it's going to decrease. It's going to push back up. This allows the system water to expand without raising the system pressure. Okay? Old hydronic systems use expansion tanks without diaphragms. All right, these types were really large in size and they were usually mounted. If they were in a home, they were usually mounted right into the rafters uh, in the basement. And those did require periodic maintenance. You did have to go there and drain them uh, because of just simply the way that they were they were piped. And this is what you would normally see on those types of expansion tanks. It looks like a big, gigantic cylinder. There's nothing in here whatsoever that's going to push any sort of water really back down or anything like that. It would just eventually, over time, because of the construction and the way things were, it would just simply eventually just fill up with water. And on periodic times, you would just open up the wall, uh, the little boiler drain right here, connect it to a hose and into a bucket and just drain it down. And the same effect would happen if this was to fill up with water. Eventually, your relief valves would start to pop and boilers would start to shake and make for people to have a panic attack. Say, so pressure relief valves, again, is another really important part of a boiler. So consider the fate of a closed loop system in which a defective expansion tank fails to absorb the system's pressure increase. As that water gets hotter, the system pressure steadily rises due to that water expansion. The pressure could eventually exceed the pressure ratings of the weakest component in the system. That could be anything of a solder joint. It could be a high vent. It could be a weak point in a, in a copper tube. PEX, whatever. It's going to rupture. Okay, most residential system components have a pressure test rating of at least 60 PSI and may withstand two or more times that pressure. So your relief valve is a critical part of the safety measures that we have in a 
boiler. Because like it says here, I mean, we have a regular testing, pressure test rating of at least 60 PSI. But some of them can be more than that, two or three times. So we're talking 120 PSI, if not more, in a boiler if we have a failed expansion tank and a pressure relief valve that doesn't open when it's supposed to. It could be pretty detrimental. Okay, those consequences of any of those things bursting at such a high pressure could be absolutely devastating. You have to be and keep it in the back of your mind that when you are looking at a boiler, it is a pressure vessel. You have pressure in there. 15 PSI in some cases, 30 PSI if you're dealing with commercial. That's a lot of pressure. Okay, so for this reason, all closed loop systems must have a protected pressure relief valve. I don't like that one statement that's just kind of points to one uh, type of system. I Every boiler has a pressure relief valve on it, whether it's hot water or steam. You have to have some means of relieving the pressure in the event of a failed expansion tank or a failed overpressurization of that boiler. Okay, it is a universal requirement of on all mechanical codes in North America. You have to have a pressure relief valve on your boilers. Pressure relief valves are designed and labeled to be open to add a specific pressure. For most of our residential and light commercial systems, we typically see a pressure relief valve setting of around 30 PSI. That's pretty standard. Okay. That's what your pressure relief valve would look like. Your pressure relief valve should have a tag similar to this. It gives you the size pipe. In this case, it's three-quarter inch. And it gives you a setting at which this pressure relief valve will open. And in this case, on this picture, we have a pressure relief valve that will open at 150 PSI. That's a pretty high pressure. That's 150 PSI sitting in a boiler before it actually opens. The pressure relief valve has a discharge outlet that must be piped down to the floor to avoid injury and property damage due to the high pressure and high temperature of the water. Should the valve need to be opened and expel that built up water pressure, that discharge piping should and must be, per code, six inches above the floor or drain to allow for unrestricted flow if necessary. So when you are looking at your relief valves on a boiler, that pipe is sticking out of it and is reaching down to the floor needs to be six inches above the floor. If it is not, you need to make it that measurement. That is a code. If a building inspector or somebody was to come out and inspect your job site and they saw that that was not a code, they would actually not sign off on your job and make you replace it and fix it. Okay, do not under any circumstance, plug, cap, or use a pressure relief valve other than which is recommended by the manufacturer. If the boiler you are installing is set for a 15 PSI operating pressure, you're going to put a 15 PSI relief valve. You're not going to put a 30, a 60, a 90, a 120. You're going to put in whatever the manufacturer is telling you to put in. It is not a guessing game. 
of what you're supposed to do. Everybody has the ability to read in most cases, and if you don't, you're, you're going to have a problem. But you need to look at the manufacturer's literature that comes with your boiler to see whether or not you have the correct leaf valve on that boiler that you are working on. Because this is what can happen. Pretty serious. That makes for a bad day. Okay. Boiler literally went through a brick wall. This boiler might have possibly even just exploded. Okay. You would never want to be on the other end of that. So make up water systems. Most closed loop systems experience water uh, water loss over a period of time through evaporation, from valve packings, pump seals, other components. Okay, so we got to have some sort of way to make up the water that has been lost. So the common methods to replacing the water is through a makeup water valve or a makeup water system, which is going to consist of your pressure reducing valve, which is better known as your water feed valve. You're going to have a backflow preventer. You're going to have a pressure gauge, and you're going to have a shutoff valve. The water feed valve is designed to maintain the minimum water pressure in a system, which is going to be usually anywhere between 12 and 14 PSI. The water feed valve allows water into the system whenever the pressure on the outlet side of the valve drops below the valve pressure setting. Your water, re, uh, water feed valves are adjustable. You can adjust the water feed pressure on them. You also need to make sure that your water feed valve is installed in the direction of water flow. So water is going to be entering the boiler this way. Notice the arrow. To adjust your water pressure that's coming into your boiler, this top little guy here spins off, comes off, and inside there is a little screw. You turn the screw to the right, you increase pressure. You turn the screw to the left, you decrease pressure. When you are messing with a water feed valve, you need to be watching the pressure gauge on the boiler to make sure that you are not going to overpressurize it. If you do, your relief valve will pop. Once you have set your water valve, you put this little cap back on. You leave it alone. If you have to manually open your water feed valve, all you're going to do is you're going to flip this little lever up into the upright position so that it is sticking straight up. And again, you are going to watch your pressure gauge on the boiler. Once that is done, you are going to uh, bring the lever back down. Your backflow preventer <clears throat> is used uh, just as the name implies. It prevents water from backflowing. It stops uh, any water that is entering the system from returning and possibly contaminating potable water or your potable water supply system. That is another code that we have to make sure that we follow. Okay, most municipal codes require 
such a device on any heating system connected to a public water supply. And that's what it would look like. Again, they have to be installed in the direction of water flow. There is a arrow that is going to be stamped on your uh, brass. Your flow check valves is another component that is commonly used in a lot of our hydronic systems and they basically are just what they say. They are their flow checks. They're one-way valves. Okay, these valves serve one or two purposes depending on the system it's installed in. Usually when you see these types of guys, they just basically allow water to flow in one direction so that you don't have any sort of heat migration going into another part of a house or something of that nature. In a closed loop system, uh, your flow check valve prevents hot water in the boiler from slowly circulating through the distribution system when you, all of your circulators are off. And when a device containing hot water is part of an unblocked piping path, that potential of that such flow does exist. So depending on the piping distribution system and how big the house is, uh, you may see flow check valves, you may not. Uh, what we really are trying to prevent when it comes to um, installing check valves is we don't want any sort of thermal siphoning, or that's what we call it, which allows heat to leak away from your system in an uncontrolled manner. So that what that's going to do is eventually it's going to be wasted energy wasted heat. Um, we all want just a boiler in our zones and stuff like that to turn on when we want it to. We don't want to have to have heat that's going to be lost for, you know, unknown reasons or unjust reasons. Okay. In a system using circulators, flow check valves must be installed on each zone. Air separators, those are going to be designed to separate air from the water and reject it from the system. Uh, modern air system, air separators create a region of low pressure as water passes through it. That lowered pressure causes though that air in the water to kind of form bubbles and then eventually come out of our system through our air scoops, through our high vents, stuff like that. Okay, one forms, uh, these bubbles are guided upward in a collection chamber where an automatic air vent expels them to the, from the system and the process of separating air from water is enhanced as water is heated. Because remember, as we heat water, it expands. So the hotter it gets, the easier it is for us to remove air from a system. And here are two separate kind of brands of air separators that we have, usually that we will see. You have your Takeo air separator, and then you have what's called a spiral vent. Basically works the exact same way, just a different construction. 